we've done uh, five principles about counting. We did the addition principle, the multiplication principle, the complement principle, the notice when two things are the same principle, and the count things multiple times in a controlled way principle. And then from there, we went through some of the ABCs that come up a lot in counting, combinations and permutations. And now we're doing the next step, which is to go through some more ABCs that come up in counting. And finishing up those ABCs, we'll move on to the inclusion-exclusion theorem, which I taught you back in set theory. And we're going to see how that connects back to counting problems. That is really a generalization of this complement principle. The inclusion-exclusion principle, if you remember how it works, is looking at the stuff that doesn't intersect, but they overlap. So it's kind of a generalized complement principle, and it's a lot trickier. But it lets you solve incredibly difficult-sounding problems. So we're going to get to that today. Once we're done with that, we're done with what I think are more or less the basics of counting. There's one more principle, which is really all on its own. And it's a really simple principle called the pigeonhole principle. And it basically means that if you've got five pigeonholes and six pigeons, that when you're all done putting your pigeons in the pigeonholes, there's going to be one hole that's got at least two pigeons. It's like, it's like a no-brainer principle. But there are surprisingly subtle things you can prove with that simple principle. And actually, there are such things as pigeonholes down in caves, these little niches out. And people used to raise pigeons in them. So if you ever saw a cave with pigeonholes in the wall, you'd see why they call this the pigeonhole principle. It looks just like you'd think. And when you're out of room for pigeons, <laughs> right, yeah, right. <laughs> There's a lot of flying pigeons around. OK. Uh, The very last thing in this whole unit will be we're going to take all the stuff we've done on counting, the principles, the ABCs, the inclusion-exclusion helper uh, generalization of the complement principle, and we're going to take it all and see how does this connect to certain kinds of probability questions. And probability is a course that you can take independent of a combinatorics course. And when it's typically taught, it's taught in a very, very widespread way, often getting into statistics, often getting into calculus and continuous kind of things. The probability that we talk about in this class is a subset of that course called discrete probability, a very small subset. And it deals with probability that you can actually count. And it's really almost a 10-minute lecture on probability at most, and really just let's do all the stuff we did before on counting, but related to probability. So it's not going to be anything new. It's just going to be applications of counting to probability in a discrete way. So the real principles are really today and next lecture, and then it'll be just probability as an application. All right, questions? All right, so here's, here's our next one of our ABCs. We did permutations and combinations last time. And now we're going to do some variations on permutations and combinations, something you might call them generalized permutations or combinations. But here's one that I know you've seen before. And again, I'll do it by example. We'll call this a generalized permutation. And we'll talk about generalized combinations. What I mean by generalized is that permutations and combinations have a very specific meaning. You have a certain number of elements. Permutations are you take some subset out and you care about the order. Combination is you take some subset out and you don't care about the order. A generalized permutation allows some extra parameter here. You're allowed to take out an element more than once. In other words, it's not just a set of n elements. It might be a set of n types. Like you have four kinds of cookies. You're in a bakery. You want to take six cookies. How many different ways can you do that? So there you can repeat. You can take the same cookie many times. That's a different kind of problem. So if you add repetition as a parameter, you get a more generalized look at permutations and combinations. Okay? That's what we're going to talk about right now. So here's, here's the first example. Here, this example you've seen before. Let's say you've got two different things, zeros and ones. And you want to, in order, choose a bunch of these zeros and ones and put them in a list. Say a list of five. Five zeros and ones. So here's an example. Well, how many different ways are there to take zeros and ones and put them in a list of five? It's how many binary numbers are there? You could list them all out. Start at 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 end at 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And you all know that inductively, this is kind of a straightforward idea. Because if I tell you how many there are for 5, then if I add one more possible thing, 
a 0 or a 1. I can put a 0 in front of all the 5 cases and a 1 in front of all the 5 cases, and that gives me all the 6 possible cases. So it doubles every time. And we've done this in a lot of different contexts. We've seen that this is the same as the number of subsets, same as the number of binary numbers, length n. Let me write it down. Binary numbers, length n, equals number of subsets of a set with n elements. 